Hey everybody, this is the first video I've done in a while, so I'm excited to be back recording. I want to talk about the letters of Ignatius, and I'll explain what those are, but first just why I want to address this topic. As I have conversations about differences between Protestant Christians, Orthodox Christians, Catholic Christians, uh, these letters come up a, uh, a huge amount, and I've actually known many people who um, because of the letters of Ignatius, that's like the thing or one of the key things that either unsettles someone in being a Protestant or even propels them toward becoming Catholic or Orthodox. So Ignatius, according to tradition, was discipled by the Apostle John. He um, is a martyr in the early 2nd century sometime. Uh, the early 100s, so just very soon after the close of the apostolic age. He's one of those that we call an apostolic father, which is that first period that we get into church history after the deaths of the apostles. And so um, obviously his testimony is really significant for us, both for his own views, but also for what that reflects of the context that he's in and what he was taught by the apostles. So a lot of people I know when they read through the letters of Ignatius and they see his high respect for the office of the bishop and what we call a monarchical episcopate, which simply means a three office view of church government, bishop, and then presbyter or elder, and then deacon in which the bishop is the head or shepherd of a of the church in a particular geographical region, like a city, for example. Uh, and they see that in him and they think, or they see his high view of the Eucharist and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And they say, wow, this is really surprising. Maybe they weren't expecting that. And just to say one thing, if there's anything else that you hear from this, the most important thing to hear right up front is that whatever you conclude about whether Ignatius is right or wrong, it's not a reason to become Catholic or Orthodox. I've kind of been dismayed at how many Protestants kind of move rapidly from maybe like a low church context that they've grown up in into Catholicism or Orthodoxy without considering other Protestant traditions that believe in a monarchical episcopate, and some Lutherans do that, but obviously Anglicans would be the main group, and a high presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And that, that, that's when I'll make another video about sometime down the line, baptism and the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist, and how we understand those as Protestants, and in relation to church history especially. The Eucharist, I mean, it, this is one that really frustrates me when it's, when it's portrayed as though uh, a high view of the Eucharist is uh, like a Roman Catholic or Orthodox view, and a low view is a Protestant view. It's very historically inaccurate. Number one, most Protestant traditions have a very high view of the Eucharist. And number two, there is development and debate about how Christ is present in the elements, in the bread and wine, all the way up to the ninth century in the medieval era, that the, the early and then high Middle Ages, you've got this huge debate between Radbertus and Retromnus, which is very similar to the debate later between Luther and Zwingli. Um, so, you know, the issues that separate, say, a Lutheran and what sometimes is called consubstantiation and a Catholic, transubstantiation, or even someone like myself, who's kind of more, it holds to the Reformed view, Calvin and Thomas Cranmer and people like that, um, those differences aren't things that are settled in the early church. Those, those differences of how we are feasting upon Christ, how is he present to us through that sacrament, those differences are debated for, for many, many centuries. So, okay, aside there, <laughs> let's focus on the issue of monarchical episcopate, or this three-office view of church government, where, where you have a single bishop over a region. Um, let, let's say, let's suppose we say, wow, okay, I want to take Ignatius seriously. He obviously affirms that or something very, very much like that. I'm going to point out that there's some differences between Ignatius's view of the bishop and uh, how that's generally understood. But uh, what do we do with that? How do, how do we respond to that? How might a Protestant who isn't Anglican or the kind of Lutheran that affirms apostolic succession, for example, how might they think about that? And I'll just say three things here. This is not to settle it. This is just a quick drive-by, just trying to be helpful, give maybe just a quick overview of how a Protestant might think about Ignatius. So the first thing I'd say is that we should read Ignatius along with all the other apostolic church fathers. This is one of the things that's sometimes dismaying as well, is when you have people who read Ignatius, but they don't go further. 
and read the other apostolic fathers. And when you read all of the apostolic fathers, what you get is a very complicated picture. So basically, I would argue that pretty universally among other apostolic fathers, shortly before and, and then around the same time as Ignatius, you get a two office view. Some examples of that would be Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians, where in chapters 5 and 6, he gives, it's very similar to 1 Timothy 3, uh, he gives the uh, qualifications for deacons, and then he gives the qualifications for presbyters, and that's it. There's no mention of a third office. Um, another example would be the first epistle of Clement, where chapter 42, it's just entitled, The Order of Ministers in the Church, and he just goes through and talks about uh, Christ establishing a church with bishops and deacons. Um, and in a second, we'll say more about, well, bishop or presbyter, which was the two? And my argument is going to be that initially, those two words were used interchangeably. But let me just mention a few other examples of writings among the Apostolic Fathers. And actually, you can see that interchangeable usage of bishop, the word episkopos, and elder or presbyter, the word uh, presbyteros, in chapter 44 of Clement's first epistle. And then at the end, he again references a plurality of presbyters in the Corinthian church, because that's the occasion for his letter to them. So you've got the statement at the principial level in chapter 42, and then at the end, the specific reference to the Corinthian church leadership as a plurality of presbyters, but no single bishop mentioned. This is what you see everywhere other than with Ignatius. You see it in the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, there's a reference written from Rome, and there's a reference to the a plurality of leaders in the Roman church. You see it in the Didache, another significant Christian. Uh, so we're moving just from the Apostolic Fathers here to just Christian writings in general in that early time period, soon after the death of the apostles, where in chapter 15 of the Didache, it references bishops and deacons, just like uh, the first epistle of Clement. Um, and... Even in the letters of Ignatius, one of the things that's interesting is just how weak is the evidence for there being a single bishop in Rome, contrary to the claims of our Roman Catholic friends, because even in Ignatius, there's no reference to there being a bishop in Rome. And he has a very high view of the bishop, as we'll point out. But he doesn't talk about there being a bishop in Rome. He just makes no mention of that, just as Clement doesn't appeal to his own authority in any way. In fact, he doesn't mention his own name at all in that letter. He writes on behalf of the entire church. And I've been amazed at how many Roman Catholic historians even will grant this point. Obviously not all of them, but some of them do, that there's this evolution or development where you don't see a single bishop in Rome until you get all the way further into the second century. And that in general, in terms of you looking at the whole church, this is a gradual development. And that's the second point I would make is that the New Testament evidence for the terms bishop and elder being used interchangeably, I think is very clear. And so I think what you get is a development or an evolution as you're getting into the second century, where for Ignatius, he will certainly distinguish. I mean, he has a very high view of the bishop. In fact, um, it's, his, it's different, though, than the traditional conception of apostolic succession, where you have the apostles passing on their authority or some aspects of their authority to bishops. Actually, what uh, he, the comparison he makes is the bishop is compared to God, and the presbyters are compared to the authority of the elders. So it's kind of a very unique view, and he's definitely got a high view of the bishop. I mean, many of his letters just boil down to obey the bishop, interestingly, except for his letter to the Roman church. But the point is, Ignatius has that, but others don't. So it looks to me like you've got this gradual development into this a structure of church government in response to the threat of heresy that is so strong in those first several generations of church history. But if you go back to the New Testament, you don't have any basis for a distinction between the office of bishop and elder. Um, in fact, uh, it's pretty clear, I would say it's, it's very clear, that the words are used interchangeably. You can see even in some of the lists of qualifications of elders, it'll revert back and forth, like for Titus 1.5, Titus 1.7, uh, Presbyteros, Episcopos, 
or in Acts chapter 20, there'll be references to a group of people that are called the, the bishops of the church, and then they're called the elders of the church elsewhere in the passage. There's many other examples of this we could point to in the New Testament. And interestingly, if you just look up the word bishop in the Oxford Dictionary, it will say, that this was used interchangeably with the word elder originally. And many of the church fathers made that acknowledgement as well. Uh, Jerome is often referenced in this as an example of this. Here's what he said, and I'll just quote it. Bishop and presbyter are one and the same. And before, by the devil's prompting, dissensions arose in religion, and it was said among the people, I am of Paul, I of Cephas, and he's quoting 1 Corinthians 1 there, so he's saying, before that happened, churches were governed by the common council of presbyters. So he recognizes that this is a development. It's an evolution. It's something that comes into being gradually throughout the second century. You see it early on with some figures like Ignatius, but most of the other apostolic fathers and other early Christian writings, you don't see it. And then it's, it becomes more and more common throughout the second century. So to summarize these first two points, I'm saying basically two things. Number one, if you look at all the apostolic fathers, uh, you see that Ignatius is sort of standing alone in his time, whenever he was writing, maybe around somewhere around 110 or something like that. Um, and then if you go back before that, you don't see any evidence in the first century of a three office view. So then that leads to the last a third and final point here is how do we understand that? I mean, are you forced if you don't affirm uh, a, a view of church government that makes this strong distinction between presbyter and uh, bishop, are you forced to say that the whole church fell into error early on or something like this? It's interesting to, to study Calvin's view on this, John Calvin's view. His basic take, and he appealed to Jerome and others like this, is that uh, this was not an error. He doesn't regard the church as falling into an erroneous practice. He says this was a human custom that was to meet the needs of the times. And that's, and he quotes Jerome, because that's the reason Jerome gives for the evolution of this form of church government. Jerome basically says that this came into existence to deal with the threat of schism. And at, that, at the very least, I know that a lot of my Catholic and Orthodox viewers will really uh, object to this, but at the very least, we have to at least have a category for this possibility that not all differences with respect to church government are the differences of truth versus error. Sometimes there are just different applications or responses to a particular time. The New Testament gives us some basic blueprints for how we should think of church government, but it doesn't tell us all the details. And so there is wiggle room in how it plays out. And if someone says, so, so an example would be like having a senior pastor. Most of us today wouldn't say that that's something that's biblically defensible. There's no, I, not, nothing like that in the New Testament. But it's actually got a, a similar argument for it. Basically, people say, well, yeah, but it's also not against the New Testament. It's just a sort of application that has prudential reasons behind it. Now, it's what Calvin was saying about the development of bishops in the early church. So in other words, you don't have to see this as necessarily an error if you don't see it as normative for all Christians at all times. Now, someone might say, oh, come on, you're saying this isn't normative, but it became universal by the end of the second century. How can you say if it's that common, how can you say it's not normative? Well, I think we've all got to recognize the complexity on this because it, it also became uh, extremely common for the emperor to have a significant role in the government of the church. The emperors called all the ecumenical councils. Popes were submissive to the emperor up through Gregory the Great in the sixth century. There was an imperial context to the evolution of the uh, government of the early church as well. Nobody can look back at the early church and say, the way the church was governed is normative in every respect, unless we resurrect the Roman Empire. I do think we need to appreciate the historical context in which the early church developed. I think when Irenaeus appeals to apostolic succession in the late second century, that made a great deal of sense for him to do that. If you're two generations removed from the apostles and heresies are swelling up around you and you're under the gun, of course you're going to appeal to that in order to, to protect the doctrine that you're preaching. That's a different kind of appeal then the notion that apostolic succession continues indefinitely, it's the exclusive uh, uh, mark, or I should say it's the mark of the exclusive church 
only if you have that apostolic succession are you the true church, and that that is somehow able to continue irrespective of the claim of succession of doctrine. The uh, Protestant view from Galatians 1 and many other passages is nobody, including the angels themselves, can claim to be uh, on the right side if they depart from the apostolic doctrine. And so there's a big difference between an appeal to apostolic succession to protect apostolic doctrine and apostolic succession apart from apostolic doctrine. Obviously, there's a lot to this, but just in the spirit of um, trying to, to see how complicated this is, there'd be three final appeals I'd make. Number one, if you're going to engage with or quote Ignatius, do so in context with all the apostolic fathers. Don't isolate him or single him out. Uh, number two, Acknowledge the complexity of it. You know, engage with Jerome and his interpretation of the evolution of the three office view from the two office view as a response to schism. Acknowledge the nuances of Ignatius's view. Ignatius doesn't believe in the exact same thing as what l people today are, are talking about by apostolic succession. And the main thing is don't frame this as a Protestant versus Catholic or Protestant versus Orthodox difference. Lots of Protestants themselves believe in apostolic succession and a, a monarchical episcopate. So um, even if you're convinced of those things, at least consider Anglicanism or Lutheranism on your way uh, out of the door of your congregationally governed church. Hey, thanks for watching this. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video uh, if you found this helpful at all. And let me know what you think in the comments. I'll have more videos coming out on, on topics related to this in, in the weeks ahead as well. <music>